off a week, actually it was 10 days or something right at 10 days since we were here last. And a lot of you came back, so I appreciate that. I'm glad you're here. Tonight we're going to we're gonna try to tie in with, just start off by tying in with last, last uh, Thursday's lesson. I said last week's lesson. Then we're going to talk about, as he, as he just said, um, the missing link. And uh, it's really nice that, that the news media has not changed the name. Right? They still call it the missing link, and I appreciate that, because of course that's what it is. It's still missing, and it really um, it kind of sets the tone for what we're we'll talking about. And so we're going to look at the fossil evidence for human evolution tonight, or I should maybe say the lack of fossil evidence for human evolution. So we're going to look at that tonight. That's going to be the centerpiece. Before we get there, um, let's see, I can click on this picture. I'm good here. Right, man. No, right. left button. What? Oh, left button. You're right. You told me that. All right. We talked about the sign of design. So what was the story of the sign of design? What was it? What was the la uh, you know, who was it? How many people were here uh, a week ago Thursday? Okay. So what does the sign of design mean? What, when I say my title of the lesson is the sign of design, what, what do I mean by the sign of design? If you have a design, you have to have a design. If I have a design, I have to have a design. And you know, I showed you a painting, showed you some you know, paints that went along with that, but also talked about all kinds of other evidence of design. Maybe the human eye, right? The human ear. Talk about uh, chemiluminescence and the firefly. And we talked about, at the very end, I, I introduced, the, I talked about the idea of on the Earth, we have, a, we have an advantage that no other planet in our solar system has. What is that? advantage we have that no other planet in our solar system has. We have, we have the atmosphere. That's crucial. We have to have an atmosphere, an envelope of gases that we have that we can live in that support life. What else do we have? Magnetic poles. We have a magnetic uh, the magnetosphere, right? And the, the magnetosphere is this this force field that surrounds the earth. And that force field deflects from coming into the earth incoming incoming cosmic radiation. And forces it north and south towards the North Pole and the South Pole and away from the center of the Earth where, where we all live, right? And that's useful because without it, the, uh, the incoming cosmic rays would, would make life untenable. It would kill us all. It would just kill us off. So uh, we need that. So what generates that? What generates that magnetic um, force field that surrounds the Earth? Right. Gravity, um, not necessarily. Not, I mean, it, gravity is part of the, the, the nature of the mass itself, but there's something else that generates it. Mm. Let me help you. Mm. Let me help you. Before we, before we get too far in advance, let me, let me give you a little help here. Okay, so I got a, a bicycle tire. I rode this over here. No, not really. Okay, so uh, this is, I got a, little, got a little demonstration for you here, and uh, maybe this will help tie this together. So here we, we're going to start off with this bicycle tire. Get it going fast, right? And then I want to just let loose of it. Okay. Whoa. Now, how's it doing that? Very well. Okay. So, how's how's that work? Ready? Yeah. Tough, isn't it? Okay. But wait, what am I doing? I'm just holding it up with a string. Okay. How's that work? Pretty neat. Okay. What's it trying to do? Uh, try to rotate. Try to keep on rotating. I tilted a little bit when I try to keep on spinning the way I had it spinning to the start with. But I didn't want it to spin. Easier if I do it this way here and get it spinning again. Alright, so what's it doing? It's trying to keep the motion that it has now, what it had at the beginning, it's, I think it's kind of cool, okay? <laughs> now, so, and it, it, it's, uh, there's centripetal forces in here, okay, but that's not really, this is the law of conservation of angular momentum. You've heard of the law of conservation of momentum? Maybe, if, you know, if you have a collision, uh, you know, like pool balls, right? You play the pool. 
and you smack a pool ball into another pool ball, and the energy from the first one is con conveyed to the second one, and it rolls off, right? That's the law of conservation of momentum. The law of conservation of angular momentum is, says if something is spinning, and it's spinning in a certain way, it wants to kind of keep that. You spun a top, right? You all spun a top or a jack, right? Play jacks. Okay, back in the day, you play some jacks, okay, but you spin a top or you spin a jack and they spin, do they spin forever? No, that didn't spin forever, although it spun for a good long time. Nothing really spins forever, does it? Well, actually, how long no. has our earth been spinning? Well, it's a long time, since the, since the creation of the earth, right, since it was created, it's been spinning, and because of the moon, and the earth, it keeps on spinning, they really work together. It's kind of a neat feature, right? We're looking for signs of design, design right? And if we're going to live on an earth, we're going to have to have certain design features. If we don't want incoming cosmic radiation, we have to have a spinning earth that generates its own magnetic field, and it has to keep spinning the same way for the entire time that we have anyone living on the earth. So if you're going to design the earth, you have to figure that out. And God, of course, did. But what's the purpose of the moon in this? What's the purpose of the moon? Anyone? <coughs> what? Think, have anyone ever, anybody ever been to Hawaii, right? And you, you've seen those canoes? What, what do they have? You know, if you take a canoe out of the ocean, how does that work for you? <laughs> Not real well. Okay, I did, I've never taken a canoe out of the ocean. I did take a canoe out on Lake Superior. Really bad idea. Okay, canoes are made for creeks and rivers, right? Uh, small ones at that, right? They're not made for seas and oceans because the the waves on a sea and an ocean are going to get quite easy to swamp a canoe. So how do the Hawaiians protect themselves from flipping over? They have a little. Outrigger, right? A little outrigger. Comes out, sticks out here, and then there's a big long piece of wood over here. And if you're in your canoe, and that big old piece of board is like maybe the distance to the end of this pew away from you, if if you want to tilt that way, can that happen? Because you'd have to, the board's holding, you'd have to push that underneath the water. Is that going to happen? No. And if, it's, if, the, if it pushes your canoe this way, a big wave is going to push your canoe this way, what would that, what would that uh, piece of wood have to do? For you to flip over, you would have to go what? All the way over to the other side. Is, it going to, is that going to happen? No. In fact, the further it is away, the more balance you have up to a point. Right? If you've got it too far out there, things would run into it. It'd be, it'd be cumbersome or whatever. But a certain distance, and it's very, very stable. So what's the, what is the purpose now of the moon? What's the, what's the advantage of the moon? Balance. Right? The moon is, is an outrigger. The moon is the outrigger for the earth. This kind of hurts my fingers. We'll try to get this going again. Try. If you get this with a drill, you know, put a drill in there and get this running. I mean, it is fast. And you can, you can do it for a long time. All right, so here it goes around. Going around, revolving around. Now, if I had a little bitty tire where it only came out to here, would it last as long? Would it be as stable? No, actually, the further out it is, the more stable it is. Sometimes people think, well, the earth is here and the moon is here, and the two don't really have anything to do with each other. Just the opposite. The earth and the moon, listen carefully, the earth and the moon are one thing. The earth and the moon are one entity. How are they attached? Remember my magic strings I talked to you about? How are the earth and the moon attached to each other? Now you can say, I grab it, right? There's gravity holds those together. And anything that happens to the moon system has to affect the earth system. Anything that happens to the earth system has to affect the moon system. And that moon is out here going around this earth and keeping it nice and stable. Without our moon, you've seen a jack and spin a jack or a top. What happens if you spin a quarter or a jack or something like that and you know spinning on the table and it bumps into something, just a little something? It might stop, but usually it does this first. It starts, it throws it off, it starts wobbling back and forth. 
And now wobbling back and forth, is that good for a planet? To wobble back and forth? No, okay? If our Earth were to wobble back and forth, we would go from super hot to super cold. Super hot to super cold. Is that going to be good for people on the Earth? If you change temperature by 20, 30, 40 degrees in a matter, and I'm not talking about just for a day, but lasting that way for for days and, and years at a time, where you drop 50 degrees at, for a year. Is that going to do well for crops? Everything's going to die off. That would not be a paradise. But what that purpose of that angular momentum is to keep us in this nice spinning magnetic sphere, insulated from the incoming cosmic radiation, oriented in the right way and spinning and then the moon is spinning around us to keep us balanced so that we don't have these really, really big swings of temperature. Any other uh, planets have that in our solar system? Large rocky planets? No. There are no other moons for large rocky planets in our solar system. Jupiter has moons, but they're very small compared to Jupiter, and Jupiter is a gaseous planet. None of the others have what we have. None of the other terrestrial planets have a, have a uh, magnetosphere. So the Earth is a gyroscope. It needs to stay oriented in a certain way to maintain the, the, the weather stability of the Earth. Of course, it has to be spinning and stay spinning. Otherwise, we don't have this strong magnetic field of the Earth. The moon serves as our outrigger for the Earth to provide greater stability. The speed of the rotation of the Earth provides for a proper magnetic field. What if it were slow way down? Would that work? <laughs> no, we'd have, we wouldn't have a strong magnetic field. What if we were to speed way up? That wouldn't be good either. What if we had something run into the Earth and hit it and make it start to try to wobble? Will it, will it wobble? Only a little bit because what happens is that moon out there, when the Earth starts to wobble, that moon stabilizes it and keeps it from wobbling too much. Just like an outrigger for a canoe in the, in the ocean. And that's the reason it's there. Well, it's other reasons. Right? God put it there for it. It serves multiple purposes. Right? But is it all just coincidence? Can all these things just be coincidence? Or does it they, they really look like it's been designed? Right? It really looks like someone took the time to design it. And it just didn't have just one purpose, not just to create a magnetic force field but to create the stability for the weather, right? And that top, the top that is the Earth, has been spinning for several thousand years now since he put it in motion. How long? I don't know exactly, but several thousand years and it's still spinning. It's still spinning. And not quite the same angle it was originally, but now we're tilted, right? And how did it end up getting tilted? Because it used to be a little straighter up and down than we are today. When did that occur? The teaser for next week, for Thursday. The time of the flood. flood. Right? At the time of the flood, a cataclysmic event occurred on the earth that some people just seem to forget. As Second like Peter would say, they deliberately forget the creation and the flood. They deliberately forget it, but we can't deliberately forget it and hope to be there. Uh, there's the magnetic field of the terrestrial planets compared to Earth being a force, a magnetic force of one. There's the magnetic fields of the other terrestrial planets. Zero, zero, and point zero, zero, six. In other words, essentially, nothing. Right? They have basically no magnetic field. So are they going, what happens when the cosmic rays come towards those planets? It just slams right into it. And you're, if you're on that planet, it wouldn't be good for you. Right? It would be lethal to you. You know, over a few years, your chromosomes would just be a mess of, of uh, all your genes would be all jumbled up because of the incoming cosmic radiation. Which, why build something and then not protect it? Right? Didn't I say the same thing about my painting last week? Why paint something and not, not put a little spray on it to protect it from other things getting on it? Why would he put us down here without putting a, a layer of earth to envelop us, a magnetosphere around us, put a layer of ozone up there to, to absorb incoming UV radiation? you know, all these different thermal layers to keep things from coming in and going out. Why did he do all that? <coughs> to protect us. Right? To make it a womb so that we could survive for a long, long period of time. Right? It was supposed to be perfect. <coughs> right? If it hadn't been for 
out of sin, it would have been perfect. All right, that ties us in from last week a little bit. That's what we were talking about last week, the sign of design. Tonight, we're going we're gonna to talk a little better. It's got the magnetic spirit, right? We need to move on. Tonight, the missing link, or Adam. Did we descend from a long life, a long line, a long line, I'm supposed to say a long line of ape like ancestors? Or was our ancestor Adam? Right? That, those are the two choices, right? That's a, those are the two basic choices. Oh, I know, there's lots of in betweens, but those are the two basic choices, yes? Alright, so um, that's kind of what we're going to look, like, look at today. Here's a, little, uh, here's a little joke for you. You've got a top 10 list, you know, Dave Letterman always has a top 10 list. This one will be a little, uh, this is for guys, right? Naomi really likes this one. Okay, so top 10 reasons why it's great to be a guy like Adam. Alright, so a five day vacation requires only one suitcase. I think that's true, right, for a guy? All right, what up? Bathroom lines are 90% shorter for a guy. Okay, the girls are like, mm -hmm. okay, so um, guys can go to the bathroom alone. That's always, a, that's always another nice feature that they have pairs. Okay, uh, you can be showered and ready in 10 minutes. That's basically true. Okay, now it may not be true for everyone. The, the remote is yours and yours alone. Okay. Anyone ever have a fight at home over the remote? <laughs> you know, and I fight over the boat sometimes. And she's wanting to go to TLC, right? And I want to go to the golf channel. Okay, so anyway, number five. Okay, we have when clicking through the channels, you don't have to stop for every shot of someone crying. So when we're going through their channel surfing, we don't have to stop for those. Okay, so uh, number four, flowers fix everything. Okay, we have to try this. Underwear three for seven dollars. Okay, so that's good for guys at least. Uh, wedding dress two thousand. Uh, or more. Touch rental, 100 bucks. So, and your last name stays put. So those, those are just, I think next week, it would only be appropriate if I have a top 10 list for women. Like, okay, so we'll, we'll do a top 10 list for women, because it wouldn't be fair if I do a top 10 for Adam and it didn't turn around and do one for Eve as well. So tonight let's talk about the missing link. Here's a quote for you. Stephen Jay Gould, Harvard Evolutions, in the 70s and 80s, Stephen Jay Gould was the leading <coughs> uh, proponent of evolution in the United States. He was, you know, at Harvard, he was the, he was it, right? He was the, the evolution guru of the late 70s, early 80s. He said this, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data, real facts, only at the tips and the nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. What's the word inference mean? <coughs> assumptions and guesswork. We've already seen some of that, assumptions and guesswork. The rest is just inference. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Not the evidence of fossils. I would even say that if he is the leading proponent of evolution. Why would he say something like that that's obviously going to make me happy? Right? His saying that is going to give, give ammunition to the creationist camp. So why would he say that? Because he's not trying to help out a creationist. Why would he say that? Anyone forget? It's true. Because it's true. Alright? And it's true. He said, you know, you've got this, you know, 900 pound gorilla in the room. Sometimes you say, you know, there's a 900 pound gorilla in the room. So you kind of, you, it, it sometimes you just have to state the obvious. But, why would he say that? Because even if it's obvious, a lot of times they won't say it. So why would they say, he say that? Anyone have any idea? Mike might remember, he might not. Well, people look for the other links. Yeah, but he, what was happening was, they kept, they, they've been looking and been looking and they haven't found them. And he's trying, he was trying to come up and pr propose a theory that would replace Darwinian evolution or even neo-Darwinian evolution. This idea of slow, gradual change. He said, if that were really true, and that of course is what's taught in your textbook, if that were really true, we ought to have fossils connecting all these branches. He said, but we don't. And we've looked, and we still don't. So, he said, we've got to come up with a new theory. His theory was called punctuated equilibrium. Mm. The idea that, uh, you know, you, that something evolves so far, and then 
all of a sudden, for what we don't know what reason, it jumps in evolutionary history and creates a completely different species, and there's no evidence of it in the fossil record. That was his, uh, his idea. He called it punctuated equilibrium, quantum leap evolution. We call it the hopeful monster theory, right? That it's the idea that all of a sudden it just makes this big leap forward, and there's no evidence of why it made that big leap forward. And he said, but, but what is he pointing out there? He said, he's really getting to what we've always said all along. In the fossil record, a creationist would expect to see what? What would we expect to see as a creationist if we dig underneath the ground? What would we expect to find? Fossils? Fossils of dead people? Sure. What about fossils of dead apes? Sure. What about fossils of dead camels? Sure. And fossils of dead elephants? Absolutely. And fishing, all kinds of other things. We'd we find the same things that we have today, but what we wouldn't find would be the things that don't connect mean. one species to another. And he says, that's what we're finding. They're not connected. We can find this group and this group, we can't get them together. We can find this group and this group, but can't find the things connected. It's almost like they were just, they just showed up all of a sudden. Except, which of course is what we've been saying all along, right? That's what we would expect to see in the fossil record if creation is true. Here is a picture of, you maybe you've seen this, it just came straight out of a biology textbook. Ever seen something like this? The phylogenetic tree, the evolutionary tree, starting with what down here at the bottom? What's this little clump of matter down here at the bottom? Yeah, some sort of a one cell organism, bacteria or something like that. And then it evolves into, you know, plants over this way and fish over that way. And eventually up there at the top is, is man, okay? The problem with this is there isn't, we have no evidence of, of this fossil seed, right? That's just what? That's just postulating. And they say, well, we can, we can make it in the laboratory. Didn't they do that in 1957? They made like, well, they didn't. They made amino acids. And were those amino acids living? No, they were just amino acids. And you have to put 400 of those together to make the very simplest protein, but that isn't life. And then we've had to talk a little bit about right-handedness, left-handedness, left time. Those would have been a, a half and half mixture, not like, not like life is today. Right? All of our proteins are a certain handedness, and that was a half and half mixture. So they never even they never even made the building blocks of life, let alone life in 1957 with the with, you know, with the Urey experiment, they, the Miller experiment, never happened. Hey, do they have the trunk? Right? No, there's no trunk. There's no line coming up here. They don't have any of these connecting branches. All they actually have is this. You have individual what? Species, each according to its own kind. But that's what we've said all along, right? Each according to its own kind. That's what scripture says, and it's what we find in the fossil record. Now we can't, can we talk about, you know, the, the evolution of the sequoia, or the evolution of the crab, or the evolution of the horse tonight? If we did that, we'd be here a long, long, long time, okay? And, and you wouldn't be really all that interested in the evolution of the horse, okay? Well, maybe some of them, okay? But most people wouldn't be. What we're going to talk about tonight is the evolution of what? If Man. it was true, the evolution of one very important organism to us. Us, right? <laughs> We're going to just focus on human evolution as they propose it. Here's what Darwin said. Darwin, chapter 9, chapter 9 is when he was, as most scientists do, when they write a paper, they also realize that their paper's not finished or perfect. So what do they do? They write a chapter that does what? criticizes their own work. And we talked about the criticism of his idea. He said, I don't know how the eye could have evolved. Neither do I. Okay? We, don't, we don't have any idea. hundred years later, how could the eye have evolved? It's too much design. He said this in chapter 9, So must the varieties which have formerly existed be truly enormous. Why then does not every stratum underneath the earth filled with such intermediate limbs? This is perhaps the most obvious and gravest objection to my theory. Darwin was saying, look, I, I don't, shouldn't there just be a 
a plethora, an infinite number of fossils underneath the earth tying one organism to the other. If we have, you know, 3.8 uh, million years of evolution, okay, not that, I said that wrong, 3.8 billion years of evolution from the very first one cell organism, according to them, shouldn't we just have a complete um, book underneath the earth that ties everything together from one thing to another, if we look for it? We should. That's what he said, and it seems logical. The problem is, of course, we don't. Well, people say, yeah, but Darwin was in 1865 when he wrote his book. What about today? Well, the fossil record should show a series of transitional forms, not just for man, but, but for every organism on earth. Here's what David Roth, evolutionist, said. He was the curator of the Museum of Natural History. What is the Museum of Natural History's job? To, to prove evolution. The Museum of Natural History is the collection that, you know, is, is where you would put all of your things that support the theory of evolution, all right? And he said this, Darwin was embarrassed by the fossil record. We're now about 120 years later, the fossil record has been greatly expanded. But we have even fewer examples of transition than we had in Darwin's day. How can you have fewer examples? How can you have fewer? Right? You find some of those things that you called links, and you find out, oh, how is the link? After all, when you get more information, it falls into a category, and it's not a transition. It, when you got more information, it falls into one group or another, and it doesn't show a connection. The more information, the more it looks like what we propose. Why would David, why would the, um, David Rob say this? This is true. He says, you know, that trade secret of paleontology, but no one wants to talk about it. You know, it, it, and it, it, it happens all the time. People don't want to look at the evidence. So, that's not me. This is the guy proposing. This is the guy supporting the theory, okay? Just what does the fossil record show? I'm not that old yet. All right, so here's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to look at two magazines. And I picked these two magazines just because um, I, I thought they were useful. This is the November 1985 issue of National Geographic. Is National Geographic a creationist or evolutionist magazine? It's an evolutionist magazine. Oh, you know, I like reading National Geographic too. It's very useful to me actually, okay? Because it's where they talk about the stuff that we were talking about. If I were to give you only stuff, if I were to say get a brochure from ICR, at Institute for Creation Research, bring it in here and say here is the evidence for evolution. Would that be a very useful thing to you? No. We better use what? We better, well, I'm saying, if, if I'm going to try to give you what they say their theory uses for evidence, what should I use? Their evidence. Their evidence. And National Geographic, 1985, was a, this one, they did this, the first time they ever did a holographic, I don't know if you see the little face of the, of the uh, little <coughs> missing link on the, on the uh, cover in a hologram. It's the very first time they've done that. It was a big issue. 1985. I've used it for a long time, obviously. Okay, here's another one. Did I just zip through there accidentally? I'll get you okay. back. That's fine. Uh, here's another one. This one is time. How we man evolved. Now, time is not a, a evolutionist magazine necessarily. But in 1999, Kansas decided, the State Board in Kansas, the Board of Education, decided they wanted to de-emphasize the teaching of Evolution. So what did, did the powers that be and the people that edited Time Magazine, what did they decide was they had to do? They had to make sure that they got it out there in the public domain, the proof, the best proof they could give for evolution. They devoted almost this entire, the whole issue to evolution. Are they going to put just their, their B, B run evidence, their C run <coughs> evidence? They're going to put what in here? The They're going to put their A run. It's going to put the best stuff. They're going to put their best evidence forward. I mean, this is their chance. You're, you're all going to, you know, it's Time Magazine. We're going to put it out there. Best evidence you can put. Because, I mean, you might, in a textbook, you might criticize yourself. But when you're in here, do you have to criticize your own stuff? No, you can say whatever you want. You can put your best evidence forward. And that's what they did. So we're going to look at those specifically. Here are the fossil finds as found in the National Geographic magazine. 
Maybe some of the names are familiar to you. Cro-Magnon Man. How many people have heard of the name Cro-Magnon Man? How many guys have been called Cro-Magnon Man? Okay, so <laughs> probably, probably a couple of you, you know, why the Cro-Magnon Man you. Okay, so, um, Cro-Magnon Man, or Cro-Magnon Man, it's really Cro-Magnon, because it comes from the region of Cro-Magnon, France. Okay, but that's the, the Cro-Magnon Man. And then we have Neanderthal Man, and Homo habilis, Homo erectus, under that category, they have Java Man and Deking Man, and the Australopithecines. Ever heard of Lucy? Lucy. <coughs> you know that? That was a Beatles song, right? Know what it is, a Beatles song? Yeah. It was playing when Richard Leakey dug up Lucy, and that's where Lucy got her name. Alright, so. Um, anyway, Lucy was a fossil find of an Australopithecus, um, an Australopithecine, and so we're going to talk about those fossils today. Cool. Why not look at their fossils? Okay, so we're going to go through them one at a time. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, on this, on the National Geographic, I'm going to go from recent, these are the, this is from the National Geographic, I pulled out, they had a big centerfold to fold out, right? Had a centerfold, actually, it folded both ways. And I'm going to go from old, uh, from newer, what they call newer, to older. All right. So the very first one on the far left here, and uh, is Cro-Magnon Man. All right. There it is. Cro-Magnon Man. See right there. Cro-Magnon France. Hey, okay, but read underneath. What's it say right there? H. Sapiens. Mom, I'm sorry, my thumb was in the way. Yeah. She's on. <laughs> <laughs> my thumb's in the way. This says Homo sapiens, and the subcategory, the sub variety is modern. Okay, I don't have to go much further with this one. Cro Magnon man, according to evolutionists, is what? Genus and what species? Homogeneous. Homo sapiens. sapiens. What are you? Homo, Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, <laughs> right? Homo sapiens. And not only that, what variety? Modern. Modern. What are they saying Cro Magnon man is? Modern. Modern man. How, how is he different than us? He is dead, right? <laughs> He's dead and buried underneath the ground, but is, is he any different than us? According to their own taxonomy, is he different than us? No. no, we can go forward and read what we know about him. Here's what we know about cro magnon man. He is actually average than, uh, taller than the uh, average man today. Almost six feet. The average fossils of cro magnon man average to about six feet. We don't, still today, average to six feet. Larger cranium than modern man. We have a cranium of about 1350 uh, cc's, cubic centimeters, 1.35 meters. What did it hit? What was his? Almost 1,450 cc's on the average. The average cro fossil was larger cranium, bigger brain, or at least brain cavity, taller than us. He was artistic and religious. How can we know someone was dead and extinct that he was artistic and religious? The stuff around him. Yeah, stuff. He, he buried stuff. With his, the dead people they, they buried, they give them things so they would have something in the afterlife and they would have pictures and stuff and paintings that they would have. Okay? And so he's classified by evolutionists as Homo sapiens. Homo, homo is the genus. It means man. Sapiens means wise. So we kind of call ourselves wise man. Right? <laughs> That's, isn't that nice of us? We classified ourselves as wise man. And today we kind of call ourselves as Homo sapiens sapiens. What does that mean, we are? Wise, wise man. Okay? So we've classified ourselves as wise, wise man, and that's actually what Cro Magnon Man is, done, is uh, classified as as well. There are about 30,000 classified Cro Magnon fossils. Lots of them, very, very complete. We have tons of them. Okay, so they're what? Okay, humans? They're perfectly normal, they fit the same. See, evolution has to show from one species to another. Does this show from one species to another? Nope. No. They're still Homo sapiens. Wise man, just like us, same according to their taxonomy. Alright, so the next one, according to them. 
And their list was Neanderthal man. There's Neanderthal man right here. Homo, actually, I think it's the. Uh, these are upside down. Hope I'm the wrong direction. Here it is. Right here. Homo sapiens. Can you read it? Homo sapiens, Neanderthalus, right? Neanderthal. Homo sapiens, Neanderthalus. What's the genus? Homo, man. What's the species? Sapiens. Sapiens. And what's the variety? Yeah. Neanderthal. Where were they discovered? Where was the first one discovered? Neander Germany. So why are they called Neanderthal? Because they were wise men unearthed at Neander, Neander Germany. But according to evolutionist taxonomy, what are they? Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens. We still haven't given ourselves any proof. There's some 1,300 Neanderthal fossils. You know, relatively complete Neanderthal fossils. Quite a few of them. Okay? They were short and stout. They weren't like cro -Manumum. They were kind of cro up here. Neanderthal man's down here. They were short and stout. There's lots of fossils. They had between 12 and 1,300 cc's brain crests, a little smaller heads than cro man, cro man, but slightly, um, you know, a little bit less than us, maybe 50 cc's, about a ping pong ball's size, less than us. All right? But how do they classify them? Humans. Humans. Well, where did they live? Northern Europe. What was their diet like? Lots of meat. How much fruits and vegetables? Probably not much. Okay. Would they have grown as tall as the people that were Cro-Magnon Man in southern France and Italy, where Cro-Magnon Man was found? Would they have grown as tall no. with a, without a good diet? No. So, are, is this, does this, can we still get a group of people today, say Eskimos, Laplanders, and take their fossils and take somebody from, from you know, southern France today and compare their fossils and would we still get the same basic variety differences? Yeah. Yes. Would we call one of them less human than the other? No. No, and neither do they for these. They used to, and they finally came up and said, no, they're just normal humans. They have fewer evidences of tra fossil transitions as you find more and more evidence, which is, of course, what we would expect. Right? That's why David Rock came to the same conclusion. Now, here's one. It's called Archaic Homo sapiens. What's this, the next one on the list? Archaic Homo sapiens. Right there. What does archaic mean? Oh. Old. It was found in Italy, <laughs> right? Instead of in, in Germany or in France. So it's called archaic Homo sapiens. But wait a minute. It's called Homo sapiens. <coughs> According to their taxonomy, what is it? Human. Old humans. Right? It's very, very similar. Um, well, I didn't have that one here. I um, don't have a listing of that. They're you know, very similar to the, the Neander, kind of halfway between Neanderthal man and cro -Magnon man. Didn't have maybe quite as good a diet. You know, 1,300 cc brain capacity, used tools, you know, lived in a decent climate, northern Italy. Okay? <laughs> so, that was archaic homo sapiens. Now, what about... Homo erectus. Whoa, wait a minute. Homo erectus. Is this one, by their classification, us? No, by their classification, it's the first time. What do the other three categories mean for their side? Wise man. Huh? Sapiens wise. They're, they're all the same, right? They're the same as us. Did that help their, did that help the first three that we've listed, does that help their case at all? No, they're perfectly normal, according to their taxonomy, perfectly normal human beings. This is the first time that they've even want this one that's not. They call this Homo erectus. Here's the very first one. Homo erectus. This one is KNMR 3733 and KNMR 1470. Okay, um, KNMR 3733. KNM stands for Kenya uh, National Museum. And if it says ER, it stands for East. Rudolph, that's a region, and then 3733 is the fossil that they're talking about, 3733. Right, now, the very first ones that started this category, this is a category, Homo erectus is a category, the very first ones were Java Man and Peking Man. 
Now, Java Man was discovered back in the 1920s. And the Peking Man about the same time, same, same uh, time frame, 1920s, 1930s. So Java Man was found in Java, all right? Peking Man was found near Peking, okay, China. <laughs> so let me help you out with the names there. So Java Man was found by a guy by the name of Eugene de Bois. And he found a human skull, and he found, oh, uh, sorry, an ape skull, and he found a human femur. But they were located about 50 feet apart in three different, in, in, separated by three different stratas, and he put the two of them together. And he called them Java Man. There was a reason. His funding was just about to run out. So he found Java Man, and he got the, he kept on going for a little while longer. He also found two other skulls, the Wadjack, the Wadjack skulls, which were perfectly normal human skulls. Did they even make it into the textbooks or anything? No, because what would that have done? Yeah, it just, it would just, it would be like, okay, if there's humans already there, then it's not an ancestor, right? But he put these two together and he made a job. He, he recounted, he recanted, he uh, disclaimed this in 1952. And then Java Man made it in the textbooks all the way up in the 80s when I studied this for the first time. When I was in, in high school in the late 70s, early 80s, this was what one of the ones I just was, was studying. was Java Man. Anyone else heard, heard of Java Man before? Peking Man. Peking Man, there were 10 skull caps found in some teeth. And then there was a bunch of tools and fire at this location. And they said, well, they're really small skull caps. Right? The brain size would be like 800 or 900 cc's, which would be pretty small for a human. So, but, since they have fire and tools, they have to be what? Man. So they put the two together and you got Peking Man. Now those fossils were lost in World War II, during the World War II conflict. Okay? The problem, of course, with this is we don't, can't then study them. There were also several other perfectly normal humans found at this site. At the same time, same strata. But what do those show up? No. These were probably what? Yes? You talked about the, the heads, the yes. skull? Maybe dinner? Yeah, they were dinner. <laughs> they were dinner. Right? They were found in the fire pit. They were probably the meal, not the man. Monkey because brains. they would eat the monkeys and the chimpanzees and the, you know, whatever, whatever. So they weren't necessarily human skulls, but they had human bones around there. They had human weapons around there. So you put the two together and you have, conveniently, Peking uh, Man. They put those two together and they made a category called Homo erectus, kind of in between. Upright man. That's what it means. Upright man. A man who walked upright. Right? But... Then they found KMR 1470, uh, and here's a picture of KMR uh, 1470, right here, KMR 3733. The problem is, those fossils look almost exactly human, perfectly human. So they throw them into the same category with these other fossils. And then what do they do with all those fossils that they put in there? They do what? They average them. And so you start with these perfectly normal human uh, fossils, and you throw these scraps in there, and when you average them, what do you get? Something missing. Something that's an average, but is neither one of them, you know, they don't, they don't belong together. This is the little, this is the kind of the homework, it's kind of the, the catch-all, you know, toss something in there to help with the average type category. The problem is, about half the fossils in there don't belong in it, right? They're, they, can, they can easily be classified as something else. And most of them are, are very, very sketchy at best. When we talk about how much of it you have, on a lot of those, they have just a few fragments of a skull cap. Oops, did I have to go backwards? There we go. There's the Kenyan 1470 skull. Kenyan National Museum, East Rudolph 1470. Perfectly normal human skull, yet they put it into this Homo erectus category. And of course, the advantage of that is it brings your average up from being just chimpanzees and you get something halfway between, and then you can call it a missing link, right? Homo habilis. Homo habilis is kind of the same thing. Habilis means handy, so homo habilis is also named 
handyman. Uh, very few fossils were found in Central Africa, in about the same region where they have um, very short black uh, people, pygmy, you know, pygmies, you know, really short black people, a race of very short black people, they called pygmies. And then they find these fossil finds and they say, look, there's this really small, these really small people, therefore, they must be our ancestors. Of course, the problem with that is, we have perfectly normal people today, they just happen to be shorter than us. Right? And so this was a category that was made up with a few sketchy finds very early on. And a lot of times, it's not, I don't even think it shows up. Yeah, it does show up. They, who do they list as? Um, they list one, they give, they give one in the, in the uh, time, uh, not time, yeah, time magazine later. Now, I wanted to show you something different. Okay? Here is the first finds that gave you Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, and Homo bilis. Okay? Alright, got those down? Then you're going to get a quiz later. Now here comes the next group. The centerfold folded out one way this way, and it folded out this way the other direction. Here's the other fossils. I just want you to take a look at them, because you don't have to be a paleontologist to make some conclusions. Alright? Alright, here's some. Here's this one for, the, for you budding paleontologists. The word Pithecus means a. All right, Pithecus means a. Australo means southern. We get the word Australia from it. Okay, so Australopithecus boisei means the southern ape discovered by a guy by the name of Boisei. That was his last name. Australopithecus boisei. There it is. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at this fossil here and that fossil there and say they don't belong together. And you can take this piece here, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that what they have on these two pages and what they list on these two pages are different. The problem is where they connected was the seam. <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming that those the real connections were lost somehow where they seamed the magazine together. They must have seamed in a few extra missing links, but they're still trapped somewhere in the binding of the magazine. Here's the other fossil finds. We're going to run through these pretty quick because it doesn't take a whole lot of figure. There's Australopithecus boisei, Australopithecus robustus, the name out there that is Australopithecus, the name means southern ape, many finds. Um, they're very fragmented. Both are very, very ape or simian like. Lucy is the best find. Here is Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, which is, Lucy is uh, right there. The black is what they supplied by the discoverer. The colored part is what they found. Okay, the black is what they made up. And the white is what they found. Lucy is the most complete Australopithecine at 40%. She's the most complete. So how much of her do they have? 40%. So how much do they not have? 60%. Alright, so Lucy was about 3 foot 11, had a brain capacity of 350 cc's, about the size of my fist, right, a third of a liter. Right, about 350 cc's. Probably didn't walk upright. Probably was a knuckle walker. May have actually been a tree climber. Um, very, very small brain size. In, in what regard is she like us and not like an ape, a chimpanzee? Is she closer to a chimpanzee or to a human? Is she a chimpanzee ancestor or is she a human ancestor? How much money do you get for finding a chimpanzee ancestor? <laughs> None. How much do you get if you find a human ancestor that fills in the missing link? A bunch, right? The problem is, if, interestingly, there are no finds of chimpanzees in the fossil record. None. How does that work out? Why do we not find any chimpanzees? This is this is a, a, it's a, a, a big void. No chimpanzees in the fossil record. Why is that? Because they're, they're taking all those 
finds that are chimpanzees, and what are they doing? Trying to make them into human ancestors. But it doesn't, it doesn't, they still know the difference because they, they're honest enough and they know that other people will chew them up, you know, the other scientists will eat them up if they don't do a good job. How did they classify them? Apes. Austral, I'll read them off. Australopithecus alfarensis. A southern ape from the afar region of Ethiopia. Australopithecus africanus. A southern ape from the region of, from Africa. Australopithecus robustus. A very thick boned Australopithecine. Australopithecus boys eye. A really gibbon looking, uh, really big ape. Big, had a big uh, kind of a ridge running down the top of its head. Right? There's no relationship to us. Those are the fossils they have. That's it. That's what, that's what the National Geographic presented to us. Conclusion. What? We were created. Okay? What do we find when we look at the missing link? What do we actually see? We see apes, australopithecines, whatever you want to call them, and humans. We don't see nothing. The exceptions, of course, are what? Where you have little pieces and fragments and you can kind of make anything you want out of it. So you'd think in the, in the uh, 14 years separating this, the 15 years separating this magazine from time, that you'd get a lot of, of new stuff, right? A lot better stuff. So let's look at the book. There's, there's an article by Stephen Jay Gould talking about Kansas giving Eva Darwin a black eye. So this is why they put this out. Here's the, here's the new stuff finds. The new finds in human evolution since 1985 are listed as, first one, Artipithecus rhomodus. Alright, so what do they have of Artipithecus rhomodus? <laughs> they have a tooth. So what do they do with that tooth? The, 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 it's a good thing, because the less you have, what? The more you get to make up, right? So, <laughs> Artipithecus rhomodus, Australopithecus onamensis, Australopithecus afarensis. That's Lucy. Look how much of Lucy they had to supply. The black is molding, is plastic that they supply, right? Then you have this Australopithecus africanus. Now, what they've done is they haven't showed you the size of that head of Australopithecus africanus. The head's about this big. Are you serious? But what they do with these, what do they do with them when you look at them in the magazine? What, what do they look like in the magazine? They make them all what? The same. They make them all the same size. They don't bother to show you that these look like the size of a volleyball and these look like the size of, you know, a couple ping pong balls, right? So they don't bother to show you that. They make them all the same size. Okay? That's a good That's, assumption trick for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, there it is. I mean, they make them all the same. They fill up the same size picture. 350 cc's and 1300 cc's. Same thing. Separated by a whole liter. Australopithecus ethiopicus. Where was it discovered? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Is that any different than Australopithecus boisei, really? I mean, a whole lot? Australopithecus garhi, Australopithecus boisei, Australopithecus robustus. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure, figure out what they've done. What's the only thing they've done different here than the other one? They gave you more of what? The extinct apes. Australopithecus this, Australopithecus that. Right? There they are. That's the first ape. And that conveniently is this entire row. That's <laughs> handy. Now I wish that they'd have scooted those over and put this one up there, because then it would have been a clean sweep. They would have had all the apes on one line, and what would they have had on the next one? Here they are. I think they give them to you. Homo rudolfensis. Homo habilis. Homo ergaster. Homo erectus. Homo antecessor, I don't know why they throw that one in there, I've never seen that in any other magazine. <laughs> Homo neanderthalus, Homo sapiens, oh they really picked a bad looking skull for Homo sapiens. They, since they have what? Any, a number of skulls they could choose from our modern population, they chose that one. Homo means man, so all we have to do, all we have to do is look at their data. What's the whole top row? Eight. What's the whole bottom row? Man, and they're separated. There's, what they haven't found is the connection, the missing link. And of course they haven't because God created apes and he created man, but he didn't create them 
from each other. We were not created out of apes. And there's no evidence in the fossil records to show that we were. We have apes and we have men. And never the twain shall meet. Right? They, two separate, two separate uh, things. And the thing is, they've told you that. The evolutionists have told you by their own taxonomy. Right? There's a Australopithecus this. All they do is when they put the end on it, what is it? That's just a person that Rudolf Fences. That's the Rudolf is the guy that discovered. Australopithecus Rudolf Fences. That's the guy that discovered. Here's our death. We know this. Our definition of faith, we're getting ready to draw this to a conclusion. Our definition of faith is, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, if you are an evolutionist and this is the evidence you put forward, you might say it this way. Now faith is the substance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links not seen. That would be, that would be their, their definition of faith because they, they're hoping that they'll find some that we haven't found yet. Here's an interesting picture. All right, eight men. This one was used to uh, was going to be used in the Scopes trial, right? The 1926 trial where the guy was uh, teaching evolution in Tennessee and got prosecuted for it. So this is the artist re reconstruction used that the scientists of the day said, "Here, we want this is we'll give you a description and we want you to draw a picture so we can use it in court." Right, the ACLU wanted them to put this uh, this picture of what they called at the time Nebraska man, also known as Hesperopithecus Harold Cookai. It was discovered by <coughs> Harold Cook. Hesperopithecus Harold Cookai. So by their own definition, they thought it was what? Pithecus. An eight. But wait. They made that from an, a single tooth. <laughs> That's a problem because if you keep digging, sometimes you find the rest of the animal. And here's what they found. After a final examination, they published it in 1927 in Scientific American, and they found it was a pig. They found the rest of the organism, and it was a pig. Yet they reconstructed a whole family of humans. This is in this century, <coughs> well, okay, in the 1900s, okay? This was not not even a hundred years ago, these are scientists. We'd already, we, you know, we'd already created that. We already understood the atom and all the the electron orbitals and intergels. And yet, here we are recreating what a whole family of humans out of a pig to be used in a court of law to do what? Support evolution as the best evidence of the day. That's interesting. If that's your best evidence, here's another one for you. Old Piltdown Man. From 1912 to 1953, Piltdown Man was used in our textbooks. Yeah, Piltdown Man made it up in the, in the late 70s in textbooks. And museums, a convincing link between apes and men, found in, in England. Scores of books and pamphlets and articles were published about Piltdown Man, tons and tons. Problem was, <laughs> Piltdown Man is now recognized as one of the most spectacular and longest running frauds in human history. What it is, they took a jawbone and they filed it down, changed its shape, and then they stained it with potassium. Chromate to make it kind of look old and yellow. But the, when, when they went back and then they did some more analyzation of it, they said, wait a minute, someone has changed the shape of this, and it's not a human jaw at all, or it was a human jaw to start with, but it's been made to look like an ape jaw. Right? And they filed it down, but they had this they had the file markings still on it. Then they tested and they found it had been stained. And then the guy it came out that this was a, a hoax, that this guy was playing on other people. But it made it in your textbooks for 40 or 50 years. If it can make it in your textbooks for 40 or 50 years, what is that, how much faith does that give you in some of these other evidences that they're trying to put forward? Here are the Australopithecines. Here is the, eight, the men. What's the one they kind of put there in the middle? Those are the what? The little fragments that they try to recreate stuff out of? All your little fragments that you might have, they'll try to toss into one kind of, you know, homo bilis or homo erectus category where they can kind of, you know, do a little average to kind of come up with something in between. Well, we have thousands of fossil finds of, of, of humans. We have thousands of fossil finds of the Australopithecines. What we don't have thousands of fossil finds are of is the ancestors for apes and chimpanzees. Why not? They were created the well, why don't we find their fossils? Because they've relabeled them as what? 
these Australopithecines, trying to make them our ancestors, instead of the ancestors of the apes that they're really the ancestors of. But you don't get any money for finding uh, a gibbon's ancestor, or an orangutan's ancestor, or a chimpanzee's ancestor. You don't get any money for that. All apes, all men. All right. Conclusion, fossil finds are either man or ape, not ape men. Right, regardless of the of the uh, what the cartoonists want to draw, but you know this is it would be bad enough if it wasn't just for humans. What about for every other organism on Earth? What about for sea mammals, for reptiles, for birds, for amphibians, for for all the mammals? Shouldn't they all be connected by a by a tree where it's connected all the way back to the very beginning? Shouldn't the, every stratum underneath the earth just be filled with these missing links if evolution were true? The problem is, and they'll admit it themselves, we don't find all those. We find the ends, the different species. We find their ancestors, but we don't find anything connecting. But that, of course, is what we expect. We expect to find ancestors of humans. We expect to find ancestors of apes. We expect to find ancestors of camels, <coughs> ancestors of elephants. But we don't see anything that connects one to the other because in the beginning God created them and He said each according to its own kind. Kind isn't exactly the same word as species, it means a little different. Probably means actually a little bit closer to the word genus, right, than species. If you get right down to the word kind and you start looking at what we call kind today, because they would label different squirrels as different species. They're still squirrels, right? So part of the same genus is really genus is, is probably a closer word to the word kind than it is uh, to the word species, right? As far as we want to translate it. Mm -hmm. All right, that was that's a tough bit of information, right? That's a lot of stuff, right? We just covered all the fossil finds for missing link, you know, all the fossil finds for human evolution in about 50 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. So. Can you all absorb all that in one time? I know. Hopefully, yeah, probably not. Okay, I gave you a pamphlet to kind of summarize some of it. Okay, but you know, there is a, there's a real easy takeaway. The real easy takeaway is there's lots of human fossils. There's lots of ape fossils. But what there isn't still today is the connection between them, which of course is what we would expect. And that's true for every organism on the earth. There's not a connection between them. And that, of course, is what Stephen Jay Gould wanted to say. Right? He said, that's the trade secret of paleontology. We've got the ends. We don't have the connecting branches. Why not? Our theory is wrong. Well, that's true. Right? The theory is wrong. Everything was divine and created. I will entertain any questions. I know it's a little after 8. It had been just slightly over an hour. We started about 6 minutes late. And it's 8, 8, 8 11. So we well, went just slightly over an hour. What questions do you have? Because I will... Try to answer any question that you have. Yeah. Well, mine's not really questions. It's just always a thought process that I had when when I used to hear people talk about evolution, you know, trying to justify evolution. If we evolve from a, why why are we not still evolving? And why do we, we still have yeah. the? We should make. I should make a, a careful distinction, which I I haven't done, and I need to. We didn't evolve from an ape, and they would not They would actually take offense to saying that we evolved from an ape. We didn't. We evolved from what they would say a common ancestor. So apes evolved over here. We evolved over here. We evolved from a common ancestor. So they would say that you know we diverged, you know, apes diverged this way from this common ancestor, and we diverged that way from this common ancestor. So they would say, yeah, but see, the Australopithecines are the ape's ancestor, but they're also your ancestor, too, and that's what they would say. But why would there continue to be evolving continually? Right, the, the problem, of course, is if you take those Australopithecines and you take all of them and you break them into the categories, you can group Robustus to be the orangutan, okay. and you can do Boisai and the others that are like him to be the gibbon, and you can take the smaller Australopithecines like Afarensis and Africanus to be chimpanzees, and each one of those is very, very, very similar, much similar, more similar to those apes than they are anywhere close to being similar to us. The only reason they would call them our ancestors is because, well, look, they have a slightly different jaw angle than modern chimpanzees, therefore, 
their you know a human ancestor, or maybe they you know their teeth are slightly different, or you know this you know, one knee <laughs> gap looked like it could could have allowed them to walk more upright than somebody you know some other ape, and that's 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 why it's your ancestor. Right? But the problem is, of course, you have all of these other perfectly normal human fossils. Some of them found in layers lower than these ape fossils that they're saying are our ancestors. They don't bother to point that out. So when they start to do the research and they, 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 they try to put a date on them, the, if, they, if they get a modern, you know, a date like 500,000 years old, which is not old for them, they say, oh, we can't, can't accept that. So you're going to have to go back and test it again. And keep testing until you get a date that is, you know, something that we can work with. Right? And, and what are you looking for? Well, we're looking for something about 4 million years. Well, okay, we can come up with that. Okay, if that's what you need, we can come up with that. And so they'll keep doing it. You know, and they'll keep researching maybe a different rock strata 100 miles away and say, yeah, that rock strata is here. And uh, that, that, that gives us some evidence. Yeah? Are we going to do anything with dating? Fossil I know dating? you were already married. And yeah. so, uh, I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really be looking for dating at this point. Okay? But um, it isn't, I mean, the age of the Earth is an important issue. And after we talk about the flood, then we can discuss more about oh, the, yeah, yeah. the dating. Right. Right. Um, as far as radioactive dating, it's like, you know, I could, I do, it's tedious and, and not nearly as interesting, all right, as something, you know, like what we've talked the last three weeks, or the flood next week, or... The or, flood ex explains a lot of the yeah, causes no, the, flood, the flood does explain a lot of the age issue. Yeah. yeah. You, are you saying then that the species that we know of today, all of them, are just take back to... Like 6,000 years old. Well, probably a little before that. I mean, if you take Usher's date and go back to 4004 BC, right. we know that this, that you know, he left some things out and it's longer than that, but not a lot longer. Not, not millions of years longer. Not hundreds of thousands of years longer. Um, there's no evidence of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. I mean, where, where, where all that, where's all that time from? You know, it, most of that is coming from um, radioactive dating methods. And the only, you know, one of the interesting things at the, at the year, at the turn of the century, you know, say 1910, and you take a radioactive dating sample from, say, 1910, then you take and, and, and see what they analyzed at that time. You know, the Earth was about, according to evolution, about 150,000 years old, right? And now here are we, you know, seven years later, eight years ago, 90 years later, and we're four and a half billion years. So in the last hundred years, we've, we've aged about, the Earth has aged about four point four billion years, right? Now, how, how did that happen? It was their, their dating methods, right? They, they just used other methods that will generate longer age. Yeah, I'm just referring to this, uh, this species that we know of, including now it's there. Well, I don't say that, thing, Yeah, I don't think if you're... Well, one, of the, one of the things that people all struggle with is, don't they date these fossils? I mean, let's say we dig up a bone. Let's say we dig up a Neanderthal bone, up in, in one in Neander, Germany. And they find this bone, they say, okay, we say this is a Neanderthal man, we want to know how old it is. So do you think they take that bone and send it off to uh, a lab to have it analyzed for a date? Yes or no? No. 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 Why not? Because there is no dating method for organic material that they would accept. There is none. Because if that is, if that's, if that, that's that uh, rock, or, you know, that, that bone has been, been, uh, been uh, replaced, the organic material has been replaced with silica most of the time, right? It's been fossilized, turned into basically the raw. But there's nothing that dates that. They have things that date volcanic rock, right? They have things that date by, by volcanic rock, metamorphic rock. They have nothing to replace sedimentary deposits. Nothing. There are no dating methods for that, right? Other than saying, well, it was deeper than this one. And therefore, we have a volcanic layer, and so you know, they find some volcanic layer over here, 100 miles away. They say, we find this age to be for you know, so, many, you know, so many million years, and therefore that's older than this, or thousands of years. And since it's lower, we'll call it older. But they don't, there's no direct dating method. They don't accept carbon-14 dating. You know, a lot of people say, well, they use carbon-14. They don't use carbon-14 dating. Why couldn't they not use carbon-14 dating? Carbon-14 is a half-life of 5,730 years, right? They would accept, that would say you can only use it for 10 half-lives. 10 half-lives, 5,730 years times 10 half-lives is 
57,300 years, or three, you know, 57,000 years. What's the problem with that? According to evolutionists, what's 57,000 years? Nothing. They say cro magnon man went down back 150,000 years, and he, according to their definition, what? Perfectly normal human. So you can't use, they wouldn't accept, if you use a carbon 14 dating method, they, 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 wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't use it at all. In fact, actually that will enter into our next, our lesson on the last week. We'll talk about that, because carbon 14 dating, if you do have organic material, would would uh, shorten the age that we actually do have. If, if they accidentally found organic material inside of dinosaur bones, which supposedly died off 65 million years ago, shouldn't have any carbon 14 in it. Well, what if it still does? Which it does. Right? Then that would shorten the age to less than 50,000 years. That would be a real problem for an evolutionist. Yeah? How do they reconcile finding what they consider to be homo sapien man in a straight up beneath? What they're classifying as. Oh, they got all kinds of things. So a flood eroded something over here and then redeposited it over here, so you got a layer that's underneath. All, all of these have to be found in what kind of deposits? Always. Every time. No exceptions. They're found in what kind of deposits? Sedimentary deposits. They're always found in sedimentary deposits. And they'll tell you how was it deposited in some sort of a, a flood event back then. They say, well, there was a flood in the a far region of Ethiopia and these organisms were swept into this ravine and then fossilized. They always say that. Every time. It's amazing how many of the fossils that they discover were what? Washed into a ravine by a flood. Which of course we would agree with. <laughs> right? But they would say that it's not a flood. They would say it's many different little individual floods and they might separate them by millions of years. But where were the millions of years? Well, that's the part that's made up. That's the part that just meets, that's the part that's the assumption that we've been around for long, long, long periods of time. And we needed that because we didn't have long periods of time. There's no chance for evolution to work because random chance doesn't work very fast. In fact, we can't find any evidence that it works at all. So it has to be a long, long period of time. And so you can separate it by millions and millions of years. And then you can make it seem possible, possible even for this. Other questions? This is tough stuff. I understand that, I mean, you're looking at, this is not easy stuff. I mean, this was like, you know, you get something that's real straightforward, simple, and just, you know, toss it out there. But when you get right down to it, we're trying to look at what they said their evidence is. This is their best evidence. Right? If you look at any textbook, I guarantee in any biology textbook, they didn't list as many fossil finds as was in the Time magazine, and probably one or two less than is in the National Geographic. These were less than four or five things that they list. Sometimes in modern textbooks, they don't list any. I think that's interesting. In a modern biology textbook, when I tried to do this, you know, I used to take a biology textbook, bring it in, start looking at what they list. The thing is, sometimes they don't list any finds. Why is that? Because the ones that they do list, they know are sometimes a little questionable. And they might be used against you, right? They might work against you just as much as they would for you. So they just say, it's already proven, we'll move on. Right? That's their, that's their best evidence. I guess they kind of gloss over it. Question? The, the next is it the Thursday night then? This the Thursday. Flood? The flood. And that's where you're talking about the pre adamite flood, or are you talking about Noah? I'm talking about Noah's flood, okay. not the pre adamite flood, if there was such a thing, right? Well, Basing it on the world became formless and void. Right. right now, there are people that would. I, I'm not sure if you buy into that idea, but um, I would say this is the flood, no, the Noah's, Noah's flood. Right, the day What? You think it covered the whole earth? I believe it covered the whole earth. I think I can prove that it covered the whole earth. Okay. Right? Yeah. Not just that it oh, did, wait. I think I can prove that it covered the whole earth. Then I can prove it to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah! Okay. I would, that would be fun. I would love to sit down with you and discuss it. I, I can prove to you how it happened, I think. I think we can look at the evidence and see how the flood occurred, when it occurred, if it matches scripture. And then, if it matches scripture, then we can say, okay, if scripture said this is what happened, it flooded the whole earth, it covered every the highest mountain, you know, depth of so many meters, you know, or did it use meters? 
okay, that that we can that we can trust that what the flood said really happened. And if that really happened, and yet all paleontologists ignore that it really happened, so you're wanting to put a pre-Adamic flood where you have you know all this layers being laid down at some you know previous cataclysm, okay, which is a possibility. Okay, using the word, you know, between verse 1 and verse 2, the word became, okay, the word became formless and void, we can see that the earth was formless and void. Okay, um, you know, we can talk about that, but I think I can prove when this flood occurred. I think I can prove how it occurred. I think I can give you a demonstration of how it worked, okay, and see if we can bring next to the trucks. Now, it's going to get wet. Yeah, it's going to get wet. Any other questions? All right, Mike. Yep. Next week or Thursday, flood. So bring your swimming trunks. Um, uh, I, I mean, obviously there, there's the word faith that comes up, even with evolutionists. Uh, time and chance is what they put their faith in. And as Christians, we're, we're not saying that it doesn't take faith. That without faith, it's impossible to please God. You have to have that faith. You have to put your faith in God in order to even please Him. And, and uh, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8, it says we're saved by grace through faith. And so we're not, we're not saying that we can exactly prove and show you signs of wonder of God just 100%. It does take faith. And that's what God wants. And the question is, what is your faith in? In time and chance, is it in that we just happen to appear? Or is your faith in something more practical, I think more practical, that we were created and designed by a loving God who desperately just wants to know you and wants to be involved with your life? And if you have any questions about that, if you're ready to <laughs> step in and put that faith in Christ and in a, a creator God, we're here for you. And uh, if, you, if you want to talk about that, don't, don't leave come and talk, and uh, we'll talk to Mr. Lewis about that as well. So thanks again for, for coming, and uh, we'll see you guys next week, and I will make coffee, coffee no, this week, Thursday. I said it twice, I will make coffee again, okay, I promise, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, thank you for your grace, <laughs> thank you for uh, just the evidence in people's lives of how we've changed them, not through evolution, but through your son through the Holy Spirit. God, I pray, Lord, that as you're working in our lives and in our hearts through this class, God, that we would seek out questions that we need to ask. And God, as we come to the realization that you are a creator, that we can ask the question, what now? Thank you again for everyone um, in the community and their support here. And I pray you bless them as they travel home tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.